Good afternoon and welcome to Carlam Cymru revision sessions. This session will focus on AS biology and will be presented by Natalie Gowman from Ascol Pro TV. The session will last around 45 minutes where the teacher will go through the relevant subject content. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer section and we will endeavour to answer your question during the session. The session will be recorded with a recording and any relevant resources uploaded to the Airskull website in the Kalam Cymru area. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to focus on gas exchange in humans today and insects if I get time. Um, I've done another session two weeks ago on looking at respiratory surfaces and looking at that in um, fish. So if you want to look at that, then you need to go back. But I'm going to presume that you have some knowledge by this point. So we're going to look at gas exchange in humans and you need to know these particular things. So the functions of the parts of the respiratory system, how air is moved in and out of the lungs during inspiration and expiration, the essential features of alveoli and how gases are exchanged in the alveoli. So I'm going to start off with giving you 10 seconds to see if you can label the following diagram. OK, A, hopefully you remember, is the trachea. B is the bronchus, OK, or bronchi if it's labelling both. And C is the bronchiole or bronchioles if it's labelling more than one. So what is at the end of each of the bronchioles? Can you remember? Hopefully you got that at the end of each bronchiole is the alveolus, if it's one or alveoli plural. And here you can see the structure of the human breathing system. So you can see the trachea, the bronchus, the bronchioles and into the alveoli, which you can't see here. And you can see that this is all maintained within the ribs here. And you can see the diaphragm at the bottom. And we want you to kind of keep this image in mind. So keeping this image in mind, um, I'm just going to point out here that this is how we show the cross section of the ribs. And we're going to talk about this section in between in a little while. So the lungs are enclosed in an airtight compartment named the thorax. So that region is called the thorax. There are pleural membranes, specific membranes, that surround each lung and they line the thorax, they surround it. The, between the membranes, there is a pleural fluid between the, um, in the cavity, sorry, that should say lubricant, I will update that. So the pleural fluid fills the cavity between the membranes, which prevents friction between the lungs and the chest cavity as the lungs move. Because we've got the movement of the lungs and the chest cavity, we don't want any friction because this would cause problems. So it is lined with a fluid. At the base of the thorax is a dome shaped sheet of muscle that I showed you just now here, a dome shape. Um, named the diaphragm and it separates the thorax from the abdomen. So it's keeping everything separate here. The ribs then surround the thorax. The intercostal muscles are between the ribs and this is what I was mentioning here. OK, we'll see them more clearly on another diagram. The trachea is flexible, bringing air into the lungs and the two bronchi, OK, or bronchi, it doesn't matter, branch from the trachea. The branching networks of tubes called bronchioles attach to the bronchi. So we've got trachea, bronchi, bronchioles. And at the end of the bronchioles, you have the alveoli. And this is what we refer to as the air sacs where gas exchange takes place. So keeping all of that in mind, we're going to have a look at this image here. OK, so you can see that the pleural cavity, this is where the fluid would be. And we have the pleural membranes. OK, and remembering then that this keeps from any friction with these membranes moving. Here you can see a better diagram of the intercostal muscles. They line in between the ribs, but this is how they're often shown in diagrams. So we have the rib and then we have an area of muscle, the rib, an area of muscle. Here again. 
we're going to look at gas exchange. So now I want you to remember the pathway of air into the body and out of, of course. So we have air coming in through the nostrils and in through the mouth, then traveling down the trachea into the bronchi, into the bronchioles, traveling to the alveoli at the end of the bronchiole. You can see that here in more detail. And as you can see, there's a large surface area because of the outfoldings here. And you can also see a good capillary network surrounding these alveoli. Hopefully you can see these blue and red lines that I'm kind of highlighting here. That is the capillary network surrounding the alveoli. And we're going to look at why in a moment. Right, you don't need to worry about these top two, but I would like you to go and look at this question at this diagram now, and I'd like you to label this diagram. I'm going to give you about 20 seconds and come back and give you the answer. OK, let's look at these answers. If you don't, if you're not ready for the answers, you can just press pause. So here we have the trachea. Here we're pointing at the lung itself. OK, some of you may have thought about the pleural membrane also. That's no problem. Here we're pointing at an alveolus. Here we're pointing at the bronchus. It's one, so it's bronchus. Here we're pointing at a bronchiole. Here we're pointing at the heart, okay, not a part of the respiratory system, but it is in the same region. Here we're pointing at a rib in the rib cage, okay, here also pointing at a rib. Here is the diaphragm, okay, funny spelling there, remember, and here we're looking at the intercostal muscles. Okay, so I'll just write that down so you can see them all and you can check to see if you understood. Let's look at ventilation. So mammals ventilate their lungs by negative pressure breathing. OK, and we're going to look at this negative pressure in a moment. So this means that air enters the lungs when the air pressure inside the lungs is less than the pressure in the atmosphere. So it's less than atmospheric pressure and so it gets pushed in. We're going to refer to the intercostal muscles OK, and we're going to look at two different types. The internal is intercostal muscles, which you can see here in the light green, uh, lime green, yellowy colour and the external intercostal muscles, which are these dark green colour. OK, you don't have to worry about them too much, but you do need to refer to them correctly. So let's have a look at inhalation or inspiration, both meaning the same thing. So I've put this in order for you. OK. Um, we need to remember inspiration and expiration. Inspiration is breathing in. It's an active process because muscular contraction requires energy. So the muscles are going to be moving here and for them to move, for them to contract, energy is required. So it is an active process because of that. The external intercostal muscles contract. And that's all you need to really comment on, but we need to then be aware because um, muscles work in pairs, it means the internal intercostal muscles are relaxed. The ribs are pulled upwards and outwards. So as the external intercostal muscles contract, they pull the rib cage up and outwards. And you can feel this if you put your hands on your ribs. At the same time, OK, so I would say at the same time rather than simultaneously, it's quite posh English. So at the same time, the diaphragm muscles contract, OK, the diaphragm muscles, OK, it's not just a muscle, it's muscles contract and they flatten. OK, so as they contract, they don't move up. OK, they're not like our biceps. We're contracting and it moves down, it flattens. So both of those actions of the rib cage being pulled upwards and outwards and the diaphragm flattening means there is an increase in thoracic volume.
So you remember we referred to this area as the thorax. So the volume of the thorax has increased. The thoracic cavity or the thoracic um, volume has increased. This means that the pressure in the lungs is reduced. There's less pressure, same amount of air there at the moment, and we've opened up the space. So the pressure inside the lungs is decreasing, which means the atmospheric air pressure is now greater. So the pressure of the air around you is greater than the pressure inside your lungs. And so air is forced into the lungs, okay? We don't actively think about breathing. Air is pushed in because of the pressure. So give you 10 seconds to read over that, and then you're going to put the process in place for expiration or exhalation. Okay, I want you to think now about expiration. And I'll warn you before I move the slide because there are some um, things to help you there, some guidance. So go at it now to try and explain expiration. Okay, and if you don't want any help, any guidance, then press pause. Otherwise, I've given you this with some missing words. So breathing out is mainly a passive process. Can you think why it might be passive? And then you can look at the missing words to fill in expiration. Okay, breathing out is mainly a passive process because it, the muscles are no longer contracting, they're relaxing. However, we do know that um, they work in pairs, so some muscles will be contracting. So it's mainly passive, but not completely. So the external intercostal, intercostal muscles relax. Okay, relax, I'll write this in if that helps, which means the internal intercostal muscles contract as they work in pairs. The ribs move down and in, so it's the opposite. At the same time or simultaneously, the diaphragm muscles relax and domes upwards again. Both of these actions result in a, can you remember, a decreased or reduced, okay, a decrease in thoracic volume. This increases the pressure in the lungs and air pressure in the lungs is now greater than the pressure in the atmospheric air and so air is forced out of the lungs. And here we can look at um, the movement of air. We can look at O2 moving into the blood and CO2 moving out of the blood. Now, it's really important that you remember that you breathe in air and you breathe out air. But during gas exchange, oxygen and carbon dioxide are moving into and out of the alveolus and capillary. You do need to be aware of these micrograms. Okay, micrographs. So here is your alveolus, okay? And here you can see the blood vessel, okay? So expiration, another point about expiration that you need to be aware of is that lung tissue itself is elastic and so it recoils and therefore regains the shape it had at the beginning. So it regains its original shape and the recoil then plays a part in pushing out air from the lungs because they're recoiling coming back to their original shape it pushes air from the lungs let's look at the adaptations of the alveoli then so the inside surfaces of the alveoli are coated with a surfactant like a lubrication the gases dissolve in the surfactant moisture lining the alveoli it's made of moist secretions containing phospholipid and protein and has a low surface tension, preventing the alveoli from collapsing in on themselves. If you remember at the beginning, we looked at it and they had outfoldings. It prevents them collapsing in on themselves and on one another. 
OK, you can see here. OK, there's also an extensive capillary network that surrounds the alveoli and maintains the diffusion gradients. So carbon dioxide is rapidly brought to the alveoli and oxygen is rapidly diffused and carried away by red blood cells. So it's maintaining the concentration gradients because we're taking the oxygen into the blood and away, which means that when the next red blood, red blood cell comes past, the oxygen will diffuse again and again and again. Okay. And the same, the opposite direction. So the CO2 will come out and be taken away from the alveolus or the alveoli. Okay, another little look here. So they could give you a diagram like this. And we're going to look at the walls in this case. And we also need to remember this is true of the capillary wall also. So the membranes are made of, so the alveoli membrane is made of squamous epithelium. It's only one cell thin or thick. It doesn't matter which way you pronounce, you say that. So the diffusion pathway is short. We also know this is true of the capillary membrane. It's one cell thin. So the diffusion pathway is short. And here you can sort of see the idea of the capillary network. The lungs filled with millions of alveoli provide a large surface area relative to the volume of the body. It's important that we have the lungs because we cannot get the nutrients that we need in through our skin. So the alveoli being the shape that they are, provide a large surface area to enable gas exchange to happen efficiently. OK, and here you can see the alveoli and the capillary network surrounding them. The capillary walls, as I mentioned, are only one cell thick or one cell thin, which contributes to the short diffusion pathway. And remembering that the gases are diffused quickly and moved away in order to maintain the concentration gradient. So have a go at this question. I'm going to give you 20 seconds at most. Okay, not quite 20 seconds, but I think it's enough. So let's have a look at the answer. Hopefully you said ventilation, okay, something about ventilation or movement. OK, um, of bringing air into the lungs and oxygen to the surface of the alveoli and the blood taking oxygen away from the respiratory surface of the alveoli quickly. OK, or you could have said it for carbon dioxide as well. OK, and here we have the composition of gases. So we can see that we breathe in air, which in involves breathing in 79% nitrogen and we also breathe out 79% sorry nitrogen and 79% nitrogen because we don't use this in our body. Oxygen sometimes referred to as 21 or sometimes 20 okay and we only use as you can see here 4% to 5% um, of the oxygen that we actually breathe in and it's used up in respiration. We breathe in 0.04% carbon dioxide and we breathe out 4% because we've produced that much in respiration. And then water vapour is variable depending on the atmosphere. But when we breathe out, it is always saturated because we produce water vapour during respiration and moisture evaporates from the surface of the alveoli as well. So you may need to calculate, OK, so percentage inhaled oxygen equals percentage of oxygen in inhaled air. So if we take the 20 for now and percentage of air that is oxygen times 100. OK, so if we look at you can use 20 or 21, remember. So if you have a look at that now, calculate the percentage inhaled air for humans. So how much are we actually kind of taking in and using compared to what's available to us? OK, 
And if you finish that, you can have a look at this question below, which does link to the other session that I did on bony fish. But they remove about 80% of the oxygen passing over their gills. So which are more efficient, humans or bony fish and why and by how much? If you're not quite ready for the answer, you can always press pause. So inhaled oxygen, so we've got, we use 4% of the 20%, okay, times 100, so 20%. We're 20% efficient at using the oxygen that we are, um, that's made available to us. The gills use 80% of the 20, uh, sorry, yeah, 80 of the 20. So they're four times more efficient than human lungs at extracting oxygen. So they're much better at us at getting oxygen from the, the water than we are from the air. Okay, moving on to a few example questions here. So here's a micrograph of a section through part of a mammalian lung. And they've even labelled this for you so you can see the alveoli. OK, they've labelled a few for you and they've shown you where the blood vessels are. It could ask you in a, in a question to label those, so be aware of what you're looking for. Describe and explain how two features shown in the micrograph are adaptations for efficient gas exchange. So des describe and explain how two features shown here are adaptations for efficient gas exchange. Adaptations for gas exchange. So I'll go back and you need to think of four marks worth here. OK, let's have a look at the answer. You can press pause if you're not ready. So there are many alveoli, we could see that from the image also, which increases or provides a large surface area. The alveolar walls are thin or one cell thick, one cell thin, or you could have said the capillary walls are one cell thick. And the capillaries are close, or you could have said the capillaries are close to the alveoli or alveoli are composed of squamous epithelial cells. That's all one mark here. Pro after saying the alveolar walls are thin, this provides a short diffusion pathway, or you could have said the capillary walls are thin, providing a short diffusion pathway. This is always going to be an option. There are many blood uh, vessels or many capillaries, okay, or a good blood supply, or there's a capillary network. OK, you cannot comment on arteries and veins. We're looking at the capillary network that surrounds the alveoli. And these maintain steep concentration gradients so that the oxygen is passed into the blood. OK, so you can get two marks from saying one, three and five and another two marks from saying two, four and six. So one, three and five you can get two marks, but you need to then link it to the explanation. So if you've said many, uh, there is a capillary network, we have to say why that's useful for the second mark. Let's have a look at this question. Describe and explain the process of expiration in a mammal. I'll give you 20 seconds. OK, if you're not ready, you can press pause. So here, the intercostal muscles relax. 
Okay, they haven't been very specific here. They've accepted intercostal muscles rather than specific ones. Relax, allowing the ribcage to move downwards and inwards. Okay, they've said to ignore internal, external intercostal muscles. They're not so fussed here. The diaphragm relaxes and becomes dome shaped. This decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity or the thorax. Do not refer to them as lungs. It's not the same. So decreases the volume of the thorax, which then increases the pressure inside the lungs, forcing air out of the lungs. Okay. Question. Suggest why mammals need a complex ventilation mechanism. OK, again, if you're not ready, you can press pause. But here is the answer. So we have high metabolic rates and ventilation maintains a concentration gradient. Hopefully you've got those. OK, the next one. So let's have a look at this image for a moment. So immediately thinking about the pathway of the air and where it will move to. Thinking about the role of the pleural membranes as they've been labelled here, thinking about the intercostal muscles in the rib cage, the diaphragm, and when we might well be looking here at the insect respiratory system. Okay. We haven't done that yet, but let's see how we go. And we can always come back to this question after I've looked at insects if we get time. You might know already. So these systems have a number of features in common. Complete the table below to explain the purpose of these features. So we don't need to worry too much about the fact that it was talking about insect respiratory systems because it's asking you to explain the purpose of the features. So why are they internal? What's the, what's the explanation? What's the benefit? What's the purpose? The nasal cavity, and we don't really need to worry about this if we haven't remembered the insects yet. The walls of the alveoli are one cell thick. We don't need to worry about this if we can't remember. And the alveoli are lined with a surfactant. So we don't need to think too much about the insects at this point. So go and try this question now. What are the purpose, purposes of those features? OK, and here are the answers. So if you're not ready, you can press pause. So we're looking at both systems are internal, so reduces heat loss or water loss. The nasal cavity and the atrial cavity contain hairs, which filters air or traps dust particles. OK, ignoring these, OK, and this. So it's in here and I'm leaving it for you in order for you to see, but these are the things that they that would not get you with a mark. So keep with the idea of filtering out or trapping dust or particles. The walls of the alveoli are one cell thick, which means the short diffusion distance. OK, you can see a pathway as well. And the last one, alveoli are lined with a surfactant, reduces surface tension and prevents alveoli from collapsing in on themselves. So hopefully you've got those four marks. Next question. Again, a photo micrographs. So you do need to be comfortable with these. And it shows a cross section through the trachea and the esophagus of a mammal. Trachea, respiratory system, esophagus, digestive system. Pay particular attention here. I've shown you a smaller version of the diagram here as well as the question so that you can see the diagram at the same time. Have a go at this question, trying to think back as to why the cartilage in a mammal's trachea are incomplete or C-shaped. Okay. 
OK, and the answer is coming. So if you don't want to see it yet, you can press pause. So it allows the, tr the trachea to collapse slightly when food passes down the esophagus. OK, or you can talk about that it allows peristalsis, um, an increase in size of esophagus caused by passage of food. So it's linking to your digestive system here. OK, let's have a look at these questions. So have a look at the information first. Looking at pressure, alveolar pressure, inspiration, expiration. And we have the pleural pressure and the lung volume. So have a look at the pattern that you see here. So what's happening during inspiration to all three? What's happening to, in, to all three during expiration? And let's have a look at the question. The outer pleural membrane to move outwards. Using the graphs, explain the causes of the pressure and volume changes during, shown during inspiration. So explain the causes of the pressure and volume changes. The pressure and volume changes. So explain the causes. Of this and this during this. What's happening? What's causing these? Right, a reminder, explain the causes of the pressure and volume changes shown during inspiration. So let's have a look at the answers. Any four of these. So the rib cage pulling, um, expanding the rib cage or pulling on outer pleural membrane lowers pressure in pleural cavity or pleural pressure. Inner pleural membrane pulls on the lungs which increases the volume, now this should be a definite, increases the volume of the thorax. This is usually the safe one to say, which decreases the pressure in the lungs or in the alveoli and below atmospheric pressure, so air moves in. Okay, they've been specific about you looking at the pleural pressure here. Okay, next question. So what would you expect to see during strenuous exercise? Let's go to the answer. So pressure, like faster pressure ch changes, faster changes in volume, more rapid breathing, any one of those. This question, some of you may be able to answer if you can think back to amphibians. Some of you may need to go back and look at amphibian ventilation again. OK, so I won't spend any time waiting this time. OK, those of you who want to have a go can pause the video. So the amphibian has a greater surface area to volume ratio. The amphibian can use skin for gas exchange. Amphibians have a short diffusion pathway. Amphibian has lower oxygen requirement. Amphibians have lower metabolic rate. OK, you could have said the. The other way around for humans, for mammals, sorry. OK, I'm not going to stop there because we still have time, so I'm going to move forward to gas exchange in insects. So here's a variety of insects. So insects are mostly land dwelling. They live on land, many of which live in arid habitats, so dry habitats. They have a high oxygen requirement and they have no respiratory pigments. And this is an important one to remember for many questions. So they live in arid habitats and so water evaporates from their body surface and they are then at risk of dehydration. We know that efficient gas exchange requires a thin 
permeable surface with a large surface area. And that obviously conflicts with the need to conserve water. If it's thin and permeable and it's the large surface area, it's also really easy to sort of lose water. Water will evaporate from their surface easily and they will become dehydrated. So in order to reduce water loss, they have a waterproof layer covering the surface of the body, such as an exoskeleton found in insects. So it's rigid and has a thin waxy layer over a thicker layer of chitin, and this is to ensure that they do not become dehydrated. Surface area to volume ratio. So insects have a relatively small air surface area to volume ratio. So even without the impermeable exoskeleton, they wouldn't be able to use their surface for gas exchange in order to diffuse gases efficiently and quickly enough. Right, and here is a diagram of an insect, quite a common one that's used in exams. We're going to be thinking about this section here. So the first thing we're going to look at is spiracles. So these are small opening, uh, openings along the thorax and the abdomen. And they're similar to the stomata on a leaf, if you can remember from GCSE. So they also lose water. So if they're open, they will lose water. They are opened and closed by sphincters and are kept closed as much as possible to minimise water loss, the same as stomata. The hairs covering the spiracles in some insects also contribute to water loss prevention. So I'll show you an image in a moment and you can see that there are numerous hairs which will stop the water, try and prevent the water from escaping. They also prevent solid particles getting into them. The spiracles here, okay, so you can see the hairs, okay, you can see hairs here to stop the water or to try and prevent the water from escaping. The spiracles then branch into trachea and these are air tubes lined with spirals of chitin. Okay, remember this word. And those trachea then branch into smaller tubules called tracheals. The trachea are relatively impermeable to gases. This is not where gas exchange is happening. They branch into the tracheoles, and this is where gases are uh, that's freely permeable to gases. So this is where the gas exchange is happening. There's no chitin anymore, and they're small, so they spread through the tissues and between individual cells, a bit like our capillaries do. They are moist with tracheal fluid. Okay. Um, remembering back to the question we looked at just now, why do they have that fluid? Well, we don't want things collapsing in on each other and there's also gas exchange. When the insect is flying and more oxygen is needed, lactic acid buildup results in water moving out by osmosis, exposing more surface area for gas exchange. So the spiracles are opening and we're going to get more gas exchange. Insects gain oxygen and lose carbon dioxide via diffusion through the spiracles, trachea and tracheals. We're remembering that this is where it's freely permeable. So at rest, this is how they are functioning. When there are higher oxygen demands, so such as flight, so during activity, they rely on mechanical ventilation. Remember this, air is actively pumped into the system by muscular pumping of the thorax and the abdomen. So as they fly, the thorax and the abdomen actually moves, the muscles move, and that will then also ventilate the insect. The ends of the tracheals are fluid filled and are close to muscle fibers for quick exchange of oxygen into the muscles. So this changes, the mechanical ventilation changes the volume of the body and therefore pressure in the trachea and tracheal. So air is drawn in or forced out depending upon the pressure changes. So as their muscles move, making the area bigger or smaller, the pressure is going to change just like in our lungs and air will be forced in or forced out. 
There is no respiratory pigment or blood circulation needed. It's all happening via mechanical ventilation. So the air being forced in and being put straight into the muscles and then being used and pumped out. Collapsible and large trachea or air sacs, which act as air reservoirs. So usually inflated and deflated by ventilating movements are so the same as we were looking just now of the thorax and abdomen. So they have reservoirs which act as air reservoirs for when they really need it. And here's a question for you, a quick question before we finish the session. An advantage and a disadvantage. You can't have more than one of either. So let's take a look at the answer. So with advantages, you can choose from any of these. Reduces water loss, allows them to live in arid conditions. No circulatory system or no pigment is needed. Oxygen is supplied directly to the muscles, as we mentioned, and the tracheals go directly into the cell's tissues. The disadvantage is the size or the shape as a limitation. And that gas exchange in humans and insects. There's lots of useful inf um, information and questions and um, good um, slides on WJC blended learning, and you can look at a whole your whole syllabus on there. And I've got some of the information from there for this evening's presentation. I hope that's helped. Thanks very much. Bye.